Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show, a podcast exclusively designed to create more reproductive health awareness and discuss your fertility preservation options. Here is your host, the Harvard-educated fertility specialist, Dr. Amy. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining me tonight on another episode of the Egg Whisperer Show. The topic is the pros and cons of IVF. It seems like everyone is doing IVF, right? You hear about it in the news. You hear about it in different articles. Your neighbors, your friends, so many different people are doing IVF. But what are you supposed to believe? So what I want to do is go through the risks tonight. So snuggle up. I don't know why I said that. Maybe it's just because I'm feeling snuggly. So snuggle up and let's talk about the risks of IVF so you know what you're getting yourself into. So I think one of the first important things to do when thinking about IVF is to know what IVF is. So I jokingly say, and a patient of mine taught me this, that IVF stands for is very fun. I try to make IVF as fun as possible, but at the end of the day, it isn't. So IVF involves taking an egg and putting it with the sperm, and then they kind of do a little bit of this and a little bit of that with maybe some Barry Manilow playing in the background. And then what you get is one of these, an embryo. And as you're going through the process with me, I'll talk to you about what your embryos are doing, what that means to me. I'll give you updates about them, when to expect your next update, and how things are going. And I think a lot of patients, they all ask me personal questions, and I'm happy to answer. People want to know, why did I go into fertility medicine? Did I have a problem getting pregnant? And so what I tell patients is that I certainly have a story. And the story basically is I went into fertility medicine because I saw my mother suffer through many miscarriages growing up, and I wanted to do whatever I could to stop and heal that pain for her, and that's why I dedicated my life and became a fertility medicine specialist, and fertility doctors are also recurrent pregnancy loss specialists as well. And then last week's topic was on how to prepare for the embryo transfer, and one of the things that I didn't bring up is how important meditation and being mindful is when it comes to going through this process. And there's so many great programs online. You can just Google IVF meditation. But one of them that's been around a long time is through Circle Bloom. And so you can go to the website, look at the different meditations that they have, see if one of them looks good for you, try it out and see if it's going to help you. Because as I'm going to talk about during tonight's show, while IVF is not supposed to make you less stressed, it can actually make you more stressed, right? And so if there are tools out there to help you feel less stress, less alone, I want you to definitely take advantage of those. And then the other thing is one important thing that I tell my patients and their partners. So one way to communicate with a partner who's going through this, you're standing there and you're trying to support them is almost like a waiter is just say, what can I do for you? How can I help you? And just repeat, what can I do for you? How can I help you? Is there anything that you need? Just knowing that there's someone out there that's looking out for you is really helpful and makes you feel good about what you're going through. So let's talk about some of the things that IVF does not do for you. And I think a lot of people, if you look at this list, may actually think that IVF does do this. So one of the things I hear a lot is patients say to me, I'm going to try all this other stuff first, and then I'm going to do IVF when all those things don't work. There's almost this assumption that IVF is what you do when everything else doesn't work, because when you do IVF, you're going to have a 100% chance for pregnancy. And that's just not true. The chance for pregnancy is related to a lot of what's going on with your genetics and the age that you're at with the egg that you have. So for example, I'm 41 and my chance for pregnancy is 10%. Okay. But when I was 31, my chance for pregnancy was probably closer to 80 to 85% with IVF. So Knowing that going into it, you have a really good perspective going into your cycle so you know what the expectations should be so there's less disappointment. And then you have a better opportunity to plan. How many cycles should I do? How many cycles should I expect? Should I expect a good embryo the first time? Do I need to do more cycles? So the other thing about IVF is maybe going into it, your relationship might be a little bit rocky. And I can promise you, because I've been around for almost 10 years now in my practice, and I've seen a lot of stuff going on with couples, their relationships, people breaking up, getting back together, breaking up again, getting back together again. And my point is that if you think that getting pregnant and having a baby is going to make your relationship better, it's not. What I recommend is making sure 
that your relationship is on solid ground before you go through treatment. You want a partner that's supportive. You guys want to be on the same page. Talk about things like how many kids do you see yourselves having? How are you going to support yourself through this? What are you going to tell your family and friends as you're going through this process? Those things are really important. And then, as you can imagine, as you're taking injections and you're feeling swollen and bloated, you might not feel as good about yourself. So figure out ways so that you do feel good about yourself. And these are silly, silly things and superficial. But when you're going through something that's making your ovaries swell and you feel like you're walking around with big watermelons in your tummy, consider things like getting your nails done, getting your hair done, getting a massage, take good care of yourself and think of self-care as you're going through something that's invasive like this, where you're giving yourself shots, getting lots of ultrasounds and going through a surgery. Reward yourself with something that you like and only you know what that's going to be. So what about stress? For some patients, when they know they're going into an IVF cycle, they're actually really excited. They're hopeful. They're looking forward to the cycle. So if you're not one of those people, take a moment and ask yourself why. Is it maybe you don't know what's going on? You don't understand the process? You don't know what the questions you should be asking and maybe you're not getting the information you need? You don't know why you're on the medications that you're on? So take a moment and ask your questions. I love lists. My patients send me lists all the time and they keep a nice binder with their medical records, their labs, their calendars. So if you have questions about what's going on, be sure to send those questions to your doctor ahead of time. My most informed patients, and I would say most of my patients, or if not all, are very informed about the process and what they're going through because there's always constant communication going back and forth. So it's important that you find a provider like that as you're going through this procedure called IVF. So as you can imagine, when you're getting knocked up in an IVF lab, and you have your husband going to one room to do one thing, and you're going to another room to do another thing, it's not that romantic. And then all of a sudden, people are saying, now don't have sex. What I tell my patients is you can actually still be sexual as you're going through the process, but there are times where things shouldn't go in certain places and things shouldn't happen in those places. And I'm just not being so explicit about what those things are, but wink, wink, nudge, nudge. I think you know what I'm talking about. Okay, so the other thing that IVF doesn't do. And I think one of the biggest myths is that when you do IVF, all of a sudden you're going to have twins, triplets or more, right? So Octomom or John and Kate plus eight, those are the kinds of terms that people throw out to me as soon as they say, well, let's consider IVF. And what I tell patients is your chance of having more than one baby is completely related to the number of embryos you put in to someone's uterus. So if I transfer one embryo, chances are a patient will have one baby. The chance that one embryo will split into two is really, really low. It's about 1%. So certainly if I take care of hundreds and hundreds of people each year, then I will have one case of what we call monozygotic twins, but that chance is very low. And my approach to transferring is I transfer the number of embryos that I feel is going to give a patient the highest chance for having one baby at a time. And that seems to be what most doctors do. I do occasionally have patients who come to me and they say, I actually really, really want twins. So we have a very, very long discussion about the risks associated with twins. And I'm, I'm very happy to say that most of my patients with twins do well, but there certainly have been cases where patients have delivered preterm. And so you want to talk with your doctor about those risks. You don't want to find out about the risks of twins after you've transferred two embryos. You don't want to realize that transferring two meant twins afterwards, okay? So the other thing that a lot of people are feel, fearful of aside from the needles associated with IVF, is that IVF causes long-term issues with your health, especially if you've done multiple cycles. A question I get often is, how many cycles can I safely do? And so we know from studies that IVF actually does not cause breast cancer. It does not cause ovarian cancer, but everyone's different. So when I talk to a patient, I talk to them about their individual genetics, family history, what they know about themselves. Do they know if their family history is significant for things like breast cancer or ovarian cancer? And if someone has a genetic predisposition for cancer like that, I'm going to offer them a genetic cancer screen so that it doesn't mean that you can't go through treatment, but there definitely is a different approach that we take so that patients aren't exposed to as much estrogen compared to other protocols that we may use. So I talked to you a little bit about what IVF doesn't do, and I sound really negative about IVF, but I think that IVF is one of the greatest inventions ever. It was invented to help young women get pregnant who have blocked fallopian tubes. And so here we are now, and there's so many other reasons why we use it. 
not just block fallopian tubes, but low sperm counts. We use it in older women. So it is a great invention as far as I'm concerned. Some of the other options that people use IVF for is to preserve embryos for their future. So one of the conversations that I have with my patients is about fertility preservation. So I always ask my patients, so how many kids do you want? And I totally get it. When you've been struggling for years, you look at me and you're like, seriously, like, I just want one baby after everything we've been through. But when you're considering IVF, there are times and a lot of times where a patient can actually perhaps do more than one cycle because she wants three or four children. I have had patients come to me and say, Amy, I want a big family. I want a family of three or four. And so we just take our time and we do the number of cycles that we need to make sure that she has enough embryos that are strong enough to give her that size family that she wants. So that's what fertility preservation means. It doesn't just refer to freezing eggs or freezing sperm, but you can actually freeze embryos to use in the future. And unlike the bagel that's sitting in my freezer right now that has lots of freezer burned and I'll probably never eat it, embryos aren't like that. So as long as human beings are around, you can thaw them indefinitely. Human beings that know how to thaw embryos, of course. So another good thing about IVF is that you can genetically test embryos. And as soon as some people hear that, what they start thinking is this word designer babies. And you can't turn an embryo into a male or a female embryo. You can't turn an embryo into a blue-eyed, blonde-haired baby or a tall baby or a baby that, you know, will play basketball or swim like Michael Phelps, okay? It's just not possible. All we can do when we genetically test embryos is find out if an embryo has a balanced number of chromosomes. So if an embryo has an extra chromosome or is missing a chromosome, that embryo may not be compatible with a healthy pregnancy. So those are some of the things that you may choose to do. And in my practice, I offer genetic testing to everyone. I want everyone to understand the technology and see if it's right for them. And also speak with a geneticist about the technology and the drawbacks. So it's not perfect. I call PGS, which stands for pre-implantation genetic screening, I call it the murky crystal ball in IVF medicine. It certainly isn't perfect, but for now, it's the best that we have. So if if it's something that you're going to choose to do, talk to your doctor about it. Talk to them about the pitfalls. Talk to them about why they think it might be something for you to consider. And the other thing that you should know, if you don't do it up front, and let's say you freeze your embryos and you have many embryos after your successful transfer, you can certainly go back and test your embryos later. And there's a term you may hear, family balancing. Some people consider it controversial, but I feel like if you've gone through all of this and you want to know the gender of your embryos, it's really up to you to know. So for your next pregnancy, let's say you have the opportunity to look at the gender because your doctor offers that to you. You can then say, I have a boy, next time I'll have a girl, but we can't turn an embryo into a male embryo or a girl embryo. So the other great thing about IVF is that it gives us the highest pregnancy rate compared to any fertility treatment that's out there. So let's just say, for example, uh, natural conception rates for a 30-year-old per cycle, about 15%. IUI pregnancy rates might be like 12 to 15%, depending on what study you read. And then IVF really takes you all the way up there uh, much higher, over 65%. And the reason is that IVF bypasses the embryo transport system. And that embryo transport system is the fallopian tube. We have to rely on lots of stuff to go right in order for the embryo to land in the uterus. But when you're doing IVF, the embryo is just landing in the uterus. So that's why the pregnancy rates are much, much higher with IVF than they are at home. Okay. And trust me, it's still not dangerous to get pregnant at home. It's way more romantic. So my approach with my patients is I want to learn everything there is to learn about you, figure out what your diagnosis is so that if I'm giving you the highest pregnancy rate at home, meaning I've optimized everything with exercise, supplements, lifestyle tips, then when it comes to doing IVF, you'll hopefully have the highest chance possible, okay? So let's talk about some of the cons. So some of the things that you might want to go into your IVF cycle knowing so that not necessarily these things don't happen to you, but if they do, you'll know what to do in case that happens. So what I find the hardest part of IVF, I mean, certainly it's involved. But the emotional cost is so great, especially if the cycle doesn't work. So I like to always talk about, it's kind of like it's raining and you bring an umbrella. It's nice to have an umbrella just in case next time you go outside, if it rains, you have it. So just talking through with your partner or with a fertility therapist and talk through what am I going to do or talk to yourself in the shower. 
what am I going to do if this cycle doesn't work? Okay, talk through that before the cycle starts so that you have an idea as to, okay, what are we going to do? Because at the end of the day, we're talking about an egg and that's a human egg with the sperm cell. And that just means a chance for pregnancy and not every cycle results in a successful transfer. So knowing what your chances are and knowing what the emotional cost might be if something doesn't work, it's important to talk through that and what you're going to do and how you're going to be supported by your family and friends. Okay. So knowing that up front can make the experience so much better for you. And then there's the financial cost. So making sure that what things cost, how much money you should have set aside, and then talking to the financial counselor at your clinic to get a really good idea about that part of things and if they have any plans or financing programs available to you. So the other few things that can also happen during a cycle is pain. Going through IVF means having a surgery. I wish that there was a way like a woman can just take her eggs and put it in a cup, but we can't do that. I think I see a Facebook question right here. So let me take a look. I'm going to have someone read it to me right now. Is PGD necessary with recurrent pregnancy loss with IVF? Yeah. Right. So what PGD stands for is pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. So another way of thinking about it is um, complete chromosome screening or PGS. So basically you're looking at the chromosomes of an embryo before you put the embryo in. So a lot of patients with recurrent or repetitive losses, there that's happening because the embryos aren't genetically normal. So what we've found is that if you do genetic testing of embryos, you're going to reduce someone's risk of pregnancy loss. But there are also other workups involved. And so if someone has a pregnancy loss, I strongly recommend genetic testing of that pregnancy tissue. That pregnancy tissue is so precious and it has so much to teach you so that you don't have to go down two different algorithms. So if you have a miscarriage, if it's genetically abnormal, then considering IVF with genetic testing certainly could help. But if you've tested the pregnancy and the pregnancy is genetically normal, there's a whole set of other tests that you want to do. So in general, doing genetic testing can certainly give yourself a higher chance for pregnancy. It isn't required, but it would certainly make sense if that's something that you're dealing with and you're hoping that IVF will help you, especially if you're in a position of, let's say, wanting more than one child, it would be nice to know what you have in the freezer for later. Great question. So back to my tips on the other things that can you know, happen with your IVF cycle, and that's the pain. So after the egg retrieval, you'll feel really, really crampy. And I have patients, and when they get their IVF medications, they're always like, Amy, why did you give me Tylenol number three? Like, why? And I say, I just want you to have it. So 95% of my patients don't need it, but the 5% that do, they're really happy that they have it. Because after the egg retrieval, your ovaries get swollen and it's harder to walk, it's harder to move, and it's harder to sleep, especially that first night. But with just a little bit of pain medication, it's going to be fine. And I think a lot of patients are fearful of taking pain medication because they somehow think it's going to interfere with their future pregnancy that somehow taking pain medication might make the likelihood of success lower. But in fact, it doesn't. These medications are just in your system for about six to eight hours. And pain is one of those things that is totally treatable. And if you have severe pain, it's really, really important to talk to your doctor and talk to your doctor right away because there are two um, serious complications, three that can come from IVF. One is a twisted ovary that can happen around 1% or less of the time a ruptured ovarian cyst, also 1% or less of the time, and something called OHSS, which has to do with severe swelling and bloating in your tummy and fluid as well. And so there are ways to deal with that. And one way is to be seen very often. So my patients will see me on average five times during their IVF cycle. And as I'm watching their ovaries go, I'm titrating their medications. I'm giving recommendations for when they should slow down on their exercise, when should they should stop exercise completely, when they should start drinking about one liter per day. And one of the best things, and this looks super yummy, I feel like I should be in Hawaii or something, is coconut water. So coconut water is a great electrolyte-rich fluid that you can drink during your cycle. And this is really for women who have, on average, 15 follicles or more. So women who have an estradiol level over about 2,000 or 2,300 approximately are the ones who are at greater, greatest risk for having OHSS. So 
by doing a combination of a Lupron trigger with a low-dose HCG or just Lupron alone, there are other drugs as well that can lower uh, prolactin levels that can also be used to protect patients from having serious complications from IVF. And at the end of the day, you get to choose how your cycle's going to go. So I have patients that say to me, Amy, I don't want to do IVF because I don't want to have embryos frozen. And then I can say, look, you don't have to have embryos frozen. We can collect the, I'll just draw the number 10 eggs, and then we can fertilize maybe two of them and freeze the rest as eggs. So you definitely can work with your doctor, talk to them about your feelings about the process and what you feel is right for you, and then certainly make that happen. But know all the options going forward. The last thing I would want is someone to go through the process and have lots of embryos frozen and then feel really sad that they're not going to be able to use those embryos in the future. Obviously, there are things like embryo donation, which are great ways to help other families, but that may not be right for you. So talk to your doctor about whether you should freeze some eggs first. So as always, if I can help just one person through this show get ahead of infertility, that's what I'm here for. So thank you for tuning in. I love you guys. Thank you so much for listening and making the Egg Whisperer show a part of your weekly routine. To find show notes and a full transcript for this episode, visit dramy.org and look under the blog tab. While you're there, you can find a link for the Egg Whisperer newsletter, which keeps you in the know about fertility news. You can also find Dr. Amy and the Egg Whisperer show on YouTube, Instagram, or Facebook. If you'd like to learn even more, Dr. Amy offers classes at the Egg Whisperer School, eggwhispererschool.com, or you can request a consultation on dramy.org. Thank you so much for tuning in and for sharing the Egg Whisperer show with others. Keep sparkling and have a great day.